Have you ever been laser focused on any one thing for a length of time? According to um, the great theologian Bruce Lee, he's not, not a theologian for you guys, too young. Uh, he said that a successful warrior was an average person that had fought with tenacity. That the successful warrior was actually an average person, but they fought with tenacity. Um, if you're uh, familiar with Dave Ramsey, his, he'll have a quote that says um, that when you're trying to get out of debt, you need to do it with gazelle-like intensity. And so what does that mean? Well, I've had the privilege to go to South Africa a couple times, and, and uh, the Kruger National Park is the largest game reserve, uh, or, or one of them in the world. It's larger than the state of New Jersey, if that gives you any idea. And, and so you can always see, you can see gazelles in this. And I, and I kept asking the guy who was taking us, you know, wow, there's a lot of gazelles. And he said, yeah, that's a food source. <laughs> it's like Chick-fil-A. You know, and they just kind of go through, so it goes through the the uh, the plains, and every other predator says, "Oh, you know, dinner time." And and so, in order to stay alive as a gazelle, you know, you've got to get after it to stay alive, and you have to be you have to be tenacious. Malcolm Gladwell was the first to kind of, whether or not you believe it or not, he's kind of labeled that it takes ten thousand hours to become an expert at something. All those things, I would say, that's that's tenacious. That's that's tenacity. Um, in this new iteration of our No Holding Back series that I brought back from the beginning of the year, I told you that, that there were four different emphases I felt like the Lord was drawing us to into our, into our new season. And with a lot of things that I preach, they end up having a double ring. And what I mean by that, and Scripture has a lot of double rings. One, there's a, there's a word for us as a body, as a congregation, as the, the local church. Um, and then there's another ring that's for us as individuals. And those two rings, they can happen simultaneously. That, w- that we hear something for us as a body, a corporate word, and there's something for us as an individual or a family in that word. Two weeks ago, I, I said the first thing I felt like the Lord was pushing us into our new season was evangelism synergy. Evangelism synergy. And that doesn't sound like that goes together, and I encourage you to go back and listen to that message. Last week, I talked about leadership expansion leadership expansion. This week, I'm going to talk about um, discipleship tenacity. Discipleship, and I'm using red and black because it's the beginning of college football season, and we know how much we all like the Bulldogs. Apparently, they like them better in the first service. The Bulldogs. Excuse me while I hide from you. Teach the rest of the message from behind the whiteboard. All right, so these are two words that you don't necessarily seem like they go together, and I want to help build that bridge um, today. Um, tenacious, tenacity. Let's do a little off skate today. Give me a couple words of that for you to define the word, ten- or def- yeah, define the word tenacity. Did I hear Bulldog? I didn't, but I heard it in the first service, and it was a great first answer, so I thought I'd put it up there. What what are some other words? Tenacity. Persistent. Persistent. What's that? Determined. Determined. Steadfast. I heard another one, though. What was the other one I heard? Aggressive. Aggressive. Who said that? Wow. Wow. One G or two? Abbreviated. Um, all right, these are some good words to help us understand and define tenacity. Sometimes I find that the best way to define something is to, to tell you what it's not, right? To tell you what it's not, and that kind of helps. Here's, here's a little slide here about um, the opposite of tenacity. Weakness, idleness, Cowardice, fear, resolution, timidity, indecision, indifference, slackness. These are, these are things that would be not, not tenacity. Um, uh, let me add one, though, that you know, when you look a word up in the dictionary, 
uh, any dictionary, and there's more than one dictionary now. It's kind of hard. To, I'm, I'm old enough to only remember one dictionary. But, but the first definition is generally the one that's the most used, uh, the most frequent, right? And this is an odd definition, but it makes so much sense for tenacity. Is not easily pulled apart. How's that for a definition of tenacity? Not easily pulled apart. Apart. I want you to think about something that maybe you have been or are tenacious about. Have you been tenacious about a job before or a promotion or a career path? You're not easily pulled apart from that. How about, how about your marriage? You're tenacious with your marriage? If, you don't, if, if you've been married over about 36 hours, you understand that marriage takes tenacity. Not easily pulled apart. It's really, really a good um, definition. The first woman to cross the Atlantic um, in a plane was Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart said about tenacity. She says, tenacity is really not the hardest thing. She says that the hardest thing is to begin something, to start something. But you'll never finish it without tenacity. All right? so, so it takes a lot of courage and strength and determination to start something. But if you don't have any tenaciousness in you, you will not finish. How many of you know, you know people that are good at starting something but not finishing something? All right? So finishing is a lot to deal with um, tenacity. Now, why would I link these two together? Um, I would say that if you, if you need talent and some level of talent and some level of tenaciousness to accomplish anything, Okay? But if you have to do without one, do without talent. I've known a lot of talented people that really never accomplished anything. And I've known very average people that are tenacious enough to stick with something to get it done. Pastor Craig asked you to, last week and this week, if you're going to write out maybe what are some lies that you uh, have to battle. And why we're calling it fake news, because these are, you know, when a lie is repeated, the more often a lie is repeated, the more apt we are to believe it. That's why the enemy is tenacious with his lying, okay? And overwhelmingly, in that first batch of cards turned in last week, the number one lie was, I am not good enough. I mean, it was, it was like every other card, just simple that, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Here's the truth. We're not good enough. Okay. Bad sermon, right? God's love for us, what, what, what drives Jesus to the cross, one is obedience to his Father, a tenacious obedience to his Father, and an unmatched love for us. And guess what? His love for us wasn't based on our performance, who we were. He didn't even kind of pull back a little bit of us and saw our potential and said, well, you know what, they're not much now, but they're going to be, and so I'm going to die for their potential. No, he didn't even die for our potential. He loves us, and his love is out of him. It is sourced from himself. Not something, that, not something that I can earn or deserve, so not something that I can somehow drive him away. And the uh, lie of the enemy is, you're not good enough. You don't deserve this. You don't deserve that from him. And that's the lie. And so the connection between discipleship and tenacity is that when, when we give our Christ gave himself wholly to us. When the scripture says that why we were yet enemies... Why we were yet sinners. He died for us. He, gave his, he, he went all in on you and me. Okay? He went all in. So the best definition of a disciple to me is that we give ourselves wholly, tenaciously, all into him. It, it, is the, it is the only natural reciprocation to receiving that from him is giving us to him. So, so the lie, I'm not good enough. It's a lie because we never could have been good enough. That's not how it works anyway. But unless we're tenacious after giving ourselves wholly to him and being shaped by him, we're more susceptible to hearing these repeated lies 
as many as they are, and then living by the lie instead of living by the truth. So let's talk a little bit about this, this, this idea, this process of, of a disciple. Discipleship, and I say this at nauseum, so get, get ready to get sick. All doing flows out of being. All doing flows out of being. Christ, being. Christianity is not a behavioral modification system. It is a transformative process. And so I become, I can become like Christ, and as I become like him, it impacts everything else that come, that flows out of me. I can do, 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 and I will wear myself in the ground. But I can be, and then all doing flows from my being. So when I talk about discipleship, we just, sometimes we talk about information, we think about information. We think about a class, if you've been in church any time of your life. But discipleship is about being. It's about being. So how do we go about being? Well, it's even, it's even addressed as far back as Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, 1 through 9, we see this emergence of being. All right? So these are the commands and decrees and the laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. That's important. You're going from this land into a different land. As a result, you're going to face different things. And in facing these different things, the more you look like me, the better you're going to be in handling these difficult things. Okay? So, so that... Uh, so that your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. I'll talk about rewards here near the end. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel... The Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your on your for, uh, bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. God understood the emotional, the physical, the spiritual challenges, battles that would be fought in a different environment, and the way in which they were going to have a long life. An enjoyable, long life connected to Him. He gives them a pattern. The first thing He tells them to do is follow. Follow me. It's going to sound familiar when we get to the New Testament, right? Follow me. That's what he means by keeping God's word tenaciously. Keeping it meticulously. He said, be careful. Be careful to follow. Be careful is a tenacious word. Be careful. Pay attention. The, the way this is going to get done is you follow me. Then he goes to love me. Love me tenaciously. That's what it means when he says that you love me with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. How many more things can you add to that? He says, Lo love me tenaciously. You're going to look like me when you follow me, when you love me that way. And when listen, when there's that kind of love going on between two people, that all doing flows out of being. All right? And then, then he follows up with then, he says, teach me. And not teach Teach me something, but teach me to those closest to you, really, right? I mean, he's talking about your children. And then, then and anybody coming in and out of your house? Uh, anybody you come in contact with because you're going to have them up here? And where they, they'd have the Scripture kind of neat little, little packages. He's talking about discipleship. Even before Jesus comes, he's talking about what it means to be transformed by God. The process of being starts with follow, love, and then this, this kind of teaching. Um, again, think about someone to become, not something to do. 
Um, I'm a linear thinker. I think more linear than anything. I'm, I'm a process thinker. I think one, two, three, four, five. Um, that's not all how God, that's definitely not the way God thinks in the sense that even in Eastern thought, things are more, more in cycles and circles, not in linears. So I'm going to give you something that's linear and that's not, but that, that might help, okay? So, so discipleship kind of begins um, with um, receiving, being a receiver. So think about being a receiver, not receiving. Think about it as someone you are, okay? So discipleship begins when we are a receiver, God's love's been given. It's been given for all mankind. But the, it's the catalyst of transformation once it is received. All right? So we become a receiver. The, the second thing we become then would be a learner. A learner. Anytime I would coach a new missionary going to a new culture, I'd say, You're a learner first. You need to learn the culture. Um, a lot of times we listen to talk. Listening wasn't designed for us to talk. It was designed for us to understand. You need to let that one sink in. We listen to understand. Do you know how much communication would change if more people would listen to understand instead of listen to respond? Discipleship doesn't come, doesn't come about by me talking. It's going to come about me learning. The, th the third, think about being a follower. Being a follower. Um, much easier to follow a person than follow instructions. Much easier to follow a person than follow a Rule because when I'm a follower, then I, it's my being. It's my being. I learn, some people learn auditorily. Some people learn by looking at written words. Some people learn by pictures. We all have different learning styles. But part of discipleship, I start up receiving. I move to learning. I have a follower. They all happen simultaneously. And the last one really then is a reflector. A reflector. What do mirrors do? Nothing. They sit on a wall. They sit on a wall. They reflect everything that's around them. So when I think about being a disciple, I'm talking about thinking about becoming a receiver, becoming a learner, becoming a follower. So I'm not just learning, it's actionable. In all of these cases, I become a reflector because I'm going to reflect what I've received. So if I've received love, then I should be able to reflect love. The manner in which I've received it should be the manner in which I can give it. When I'm not reflecting a lot of love, I sure probably have not let a lot of love in. Okay? And so that's where the lie is I'm not good enough to have the love of God, then I only let a little of this love in, and I'm always trying to perform for that love, which means that I probably will look for you to perform for me in order for me to give you my love. You see how this stuff can just, it just kind of trickles? But I become a receiver, and I reflect what I've received. I become a learner, and I reflect what I've learned. I become a follower, and I reflect what it means to be in obedience and other people follow, they follow me. You know, the most important ministry Jesus had was discipleship. So whoa, 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 what about all those miracles? What about them? What about all those great sermons? What about them? He begins preaching and calling disciples simultaneously. His command is to go and make disciples. His, his ministry is disciple. Discipleship. Why is that important? Too important for two reasons. One, Jesus did not come here to make an impact. He came to transform us. That's different than impact. Sometimes impact is long-lasting. Sometimes it's hit and run. He didn't come to do either. He came to transform. The second reason why it's an, it was a central part of his, 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 uh, his ministry is that in order for a movement to continue, it all, always rests on its leadership. 
why some companies, companies have to pay attention, especially if they're entrepreneurial companies. They have to pay attention to how they're going to hand off the business to family or someone else in order that this business will keep going and it won't be this one generational business. In order to have a movement, there has to be transformed leadership. Jesus didn't come to make an impact. He came to transform. Discipleship is hugely important. So then what works against, what works against, I'm not revealing something new, I'm not, just more white space. What works against discipleship? Let me show you a picture. This is not an unfamiliar sight around here, right? We continue to put roads where they weren't designed to go, right? So we cut through the side of this mountain, and we build a road, and, and eventually something like this happens, right? The two enemies of discipleship are erosion and atrophy, all right? This is erosion. What is erosion? Erosion in with the water... And there was enough water and rain, water and rain, same thing, water and wind <laughs> that washed away, and we don't just have rocks, we have all this shale and all this stuff, right? And so washed enough away that there became a point in time where the weight of the rock could not be supported by the material underneath. And when that critical juncture happened, here comes the slide. You know what's interesting, though? The mountain was not the only thing imp impacted by this rock slide. Where the rocks landed was impacted. Anybody trying to get from point A to point B is impacted. Discipleship is a big deal. It is big for our own life, and it's big for the lives of people around us. And erosion, so, so what, what serves as this wind and this rain and what serves to be an erosion kind of factor in our life? Well, a couple, probably more than one, but the first one is life in and of itself, right? Life is an erosion factor in our discipleship. When God doesn't respond like you thought he should respond and we get upset at him, and we back off being tenacious about being shaped by him, that starts erosion. When something in our life doesn't turn out the way we thought it should turn out, and we hit pause, that is erosion. Anything that deters me from pursuing Christ and being shaped by him serves to erode. And life is one of the biggest culprits to make us stop. The enemy doesn't always orchestrate stuff, but he is a expert at exploiting things. I don't look for a demon behind every rock, but he's looking to exploit all circumstance in my life. Jesus tells a parable. He tells a parable of a man who built his house on the sand. And he said, and when the winds and the storms came and they beat on the house, the house collapsed. And in the same parable, he says, and then there was a man who built his house on a rock. And when the wind and the rain came, the house stood firm on the rock. His reference, his lead-in, was that his words were the rock. Okay? Now, the, the, the moral of the story is build your house on the rock. But the story of the moral is the wind and the rain beat on both houses. Scripture says it rains on the just and the unjust. So, so when we, we, I, I, I have my own woe is me and why me moments. But I'm telling you, the longer the woe in me and why me keeps me from pursuing Christ, it keeps me from being shaped by him and the life that he has for me. That's why discipleship matters. Because life will continue. It's why tenacious discipleship matters. Because life is always going to try to erode
culture. Culture is another erosion factor. We live in pop psychology, um, pop culture, pop this, pop that. And what it's, the word pop means it's come and it's going to go. Okay? And, and, we, and when, when you build your life around your own thesis, the own stuff that you put together, and that's how people build a, a life philosophy or if they won't even miss, maybe call it a faith, but maybe they build their own faith, they take a little bit over here. Take a little bit over here, a little bit of what grandma had thrown in, a little bit of what granddaddy kind of thrown in, a little life experience, a little motivational speaker, um, a little this, a little that. And we cobble together and we go, this is how we, everybody lives their life by a code. That's, how, that's the only way you make decisions, right? It's, somehow you prioritize something in your life and you've prioritized it based on something written or unwritten, but it's there. And when we piece it together on our own, where does the power have to come from for that to work? It has to come from me. Because I'm the creator of it. I've created it. I've put it together. So its, dur its durability rests on me. But when I rest in the word of God and tenacious tenaciously going after him, then all the power and all the responsibility rests on him. Uh, late 1950s, the idea of a mall came to be. Mall. And then, and then I'm like either the, the youngest boomer or the oldest exer, but in the 80s, malls were at their peak. I mean, I remember in high school, the big thing was to go to the mall. And I didn't even have a mall close to me. I had to drive 35 minutes to get to a mall. Quaker Bridge Mall. And we went... Mainly, we had no money, we, but we had to cobble together gas money to get to the mall. But when we went to the mall, you went to the mall to look at people. But, but the reason why the malls exploded from the boomer culture is the boomer culture valued convenience and choices. Convenience and choices. That's why we come up with like 29 flavors of Nine Lives cat food. Who is that for? It's for us. Convenience and choices. Why are malls dying? They're doing so many things to try to resurrect them all. You can bowl at them all. There's going to be more restaurants at them all. There's going to be more square footage taken by restaurants and anything, entertainment. Why? Why are movie theaters and malls now? Because the current culture, convenience and choices, want story and want unique. Story and unique. That's why you're not going to find story and unique at Macy's. You're going to find the same dress in seven sizes. Right? There's, nothing, there's no story there. No uniqueness there, so we'll go f try to find them out of these little boutiques that all buy their clothes from the same merchandise mart. And you but the driver, the driver is culture. It's why you cannot rest your faith in culture because it's going to change. Well, we're, we're told that. We're told that in Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that appears right, but in the end it leads to death. There's a way that appears right, but in the end leads to death. So what is the counter to erosion? Well, roots counter erosion. That's why on hillsides you'll see um, uh, hydro-seeded grass, or you'll see straw, uh, or you'll see planting of trees and other things. Why? Not because the trees and the grass keep the erosion from happening. The roots do. The roots give something that the soil adheres to, and so when the wind and rain come, it doesn't wash the hillside away. So what does Scripture say about roots? Psalm 1, 1 through 3, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, take or seat in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates it, tenacious about it, day and night. Well, what's that person like? Well, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Roots. What are the roots? The Word of God becomes the roots. A strong root system is established by being in and loving the Word. Here's how Paul relates it to a young church in Colossae. He says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, 
strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, pop philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head of over, over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Our connection to Christ isn't through some kind of um, ritual, no matter how traditional it was but by Christ himself, having been buried with him in baptism, which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. There's power. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, canceled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, by the cross. Christ's roots counteract erosion. What about atrophy? So atrophy is a, it's kind of a normal thing. People understand a little bit, a little physiology of uh, atrophy. You know, a, a muscle that's not being used will, will, will atrophy. It will, it will decrease, right? And so sometimes that happens out of laziness, right? That, you know, I'm going to I, you know, when, when my main exercise is going to the refrigerator, there, there, right, there, there's things that can atrophy. And then, but atrophy also happens out of pain, sometimes um, from an injury, and then something becomes immobile because it's been injured. A lot of atrophy, I feel like, in discipleship among believers happens out of pain. Again, back to something didn't turn out right, something didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out, or I'm walking through something difficult, and we define discipleship or favor of God in a way that's just not, it's just not consistent globally. And what I mean by that is my friends in India are reading the same Bible I am, and it has to make sense in India and Hindu, just, you know, Hindi is just as much as it does in English. All right? And so atrophy happens, we let stuff go. That's why tenacity has to be connected to discipleship because this is not going to happen just by osmosis. It happens with a tenacious spirit. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, Paul says, Do you not know that in, in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Paul was, uh, church history will say that he, was, uh, he could have been a wrestler, that, he, that, that their athletics was important to Paul. Um, and Paul wants to win. I hate to lose it ever, anything. I never let Annie beat me in Monopoly. Never. I've never let her beat me. I wanted to win every single time I rolled the dice. I'm tenacious about Monopoly. And when she beats me, she knows how much I like to win that sometimes she says she's sorry when she beats me. But Paul's saying here, we're, we're all in a race. Why not run it to win? I mean, in fact, he's questioning it. No, no one trains hard to lose a race. He says, run in such a way to get a prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. So, so the reference here is it's, it's an old Olympic re reference. I mean, the Parnathian games, the Meads games, all the different Olympic games of the day. A vine, a olive branch stuff was used as symbolizing you're the winner. I mean, like, get a, get a grip. You had gold then, too. You know, I don't know. But, but that's, that was the symbol. This crown, and it went away. And he says, and look at our culture, especially the Roman culture, the Roman world culture, of how intent they were about these games. And he said, it doesn't produce anything. He tells us this in so many other ways. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Why put so much daggum effort into stuff that's just going to go away? So we, we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body. I make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified for that prize. 
Pastor, you're talking about prizes and rewards for, Christian, for our Christian faith? I am. I am. Because roots and reward are what keep me moving forward. Reward. What am I talking about reward? Well, in John 9 and 10, we, that's our scripture founded on gateway, right? It said, I am the gate. I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly or life more than you ever dreamed of. And the part, you know, I don't put on the sign is what the enemy's intent is, to kill, steal, and destroy. The enemy is tenacious about killing, stealing, and destroying. So the only way we counteract that kind of tenaciousness, the culture's tenaciousness and all that, is got to be tenacious about how I go after God. But I do that because there's, there's a reward one is this, this life is not it. This life is a blip. It's a breath. It's a nanosecond. And, and he can reward me now, and I'll be, I can get rewarded now, and I can get rewarded in heaven. Here, but when you think of reward, I don't, want you to think about, um, I don't want you to think about monetary things. I want you to think about two specific things, peace and purpose. That's worth writing down. Peace and purpose as reward. That's why my grandmother on her deathbed at 52 said, I wish I could live longer. There was so much more I needed to do for the Lord. I wanted to do for the Lord. She didn't say there was so much more I wanted God to do for me. There was so much more to my life that I wish I could have given to God. Psalm 112, 7 and 8 says this. He will have no fear of bad news whose heart is steadfast trusting in the Lord. His heart is secure, for he will have no fear. In the end, he will look and triumph on his foes. The way I learned that verse was, um, there is peace for those whose, whose heart is steadfast on him. There's a reward of peace and purpose. There's still more after his life. Jesus, in telling telling a story about the kingdom of God, he, he gave this parable. He said that the kingdom of God is like a man who um, came across a treasure in a field. And when he found it, he reburied it. And then he went home and sold everything that he had so that he could go back and buy that field. Now, I want you to think about this. He went home. And the, the, parable, the parable's implication is, is that the guy went home and liquidated every single asset that he had sold every single thing that was sellable. Anything that could have produced any kind of money in order to buy that field. Why would he bankrupt himself, go completely, um, completely bankrupt by what everybody else's standards would have been to get that field? Because he knew when he got that field, he was going to even have more than he had when he started. Infinitely more. I, I'm just not convinced, especially as Americans, I'm just not convinced we see the kingdom of God that way. And that impacts how we chase after him. It impacts us becoming like him. Can any of us look like Jesus? No. No, not on this side of heaven. We're not going to look like Jesus. So what's the point, Pastor? Pastor. The point is I look more like him now than I did five years ago. And I look like him more now than I did a month ago. And the idea of having a fresh relationship with Christ would mean that we can say, I look more like him this Sunday than I did last Sunday. Because it impacts everybody around us, not just us. And when things get eroded, it impacts not just what has been eroded, it impacts everybody around us. It's that, it's that important. Roots produce fruit. So when Paul outlines in Galatians the fruit of the Spirit, come on up. When he, when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, uh, gentleness, faithfulness. There's always one in there I miss, so there they are. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Th these are fruit. Trees don't strain in producing fruit. An apple tree 
naturally produces apples. Doesn't think about producing apples. Doesn't work to produce apples. Produces apples. Okay? So, so when I have the root structure in Christ, what Paul's saying is that fruit then comes out of my life. I don't have to go, boy, I just, I, I, I got to work on being patient. I would say, let me work on being tenacious about Christ. And patience is something that would flow from that. Recently, I'm walking the job out here, and a couple people had a run in, and um, I didn't, I didn't witness, I didn't witness the first run in. I was witnessing the run in when the foreman of the person that had to run in was confronting the person, and um, so I just enjoyed the watching it, and um, and then the person came to speak with me and, and said, "Well, uh, I didn't have my best day." That wasn't my best. He was a believer. He is a believer. He said, that wasn't the best. What I did wasn't the best repre- representation of Christ. So what would you do then when you got called on it? He said, yeah, I owned it. And I said, I think that might be a better representation of the fruit of the Spirit than you losing it over here. Now, don't hear me wrong. We need that to drop, right? But how many people double down? bow up. Instead, in humility, I consider those better than myself. Fruit always reveals root. It's it's more a check and balance for you and me than anything else. You walk around with a checklist, kind of judging your fruit. Where, where, where I lack in the fruit is where I lack in the root. And that's a part of tenacious discipleship. David, David, David starts the process. David says, Lord, search me, and if there's any wicked way in me, Lord, search, tell me. Tell me. I want to get that out of there. It's tenacious discipleship. He's the first giver. We begin the process of discipleship by receiving, becoming a receiver. We become a learner. We become a follower. And then we are a reflector. Maybe this morning you walked in or maybe you tuned in online or maybe you'll hit play later on, someone watching, and, and you stumbled into the live stream or into the building today um, wondering if, if any of this stuff was real. Was Christianity, is it just another, is it just another thing? And I hope today the Holy Spirit, which you would not necessarily be able to identify, but something inside of you are saying, this, this is real. This is, what, this is what I've been looking for. That, um, that someone loves me for me. Actually loves me in spite of me. And that's Christ. Loves us in spite of us. And doesn't sit around cracking a whip saying you've missed the mark, you've missed the mark, you've missed the mark. But someone who dwells in us to say, let's let's move forward, let's hit the mark. He didn't come to make an impact on your life. He didn't make to come in, to, he didn't come to make an impression. He came to transform our life. There's a part in this message that that I skipped over. It's Romans 12, and Romans 12 says that in light, in light of God's mercy, in light of it, stop conforming to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In light of God's mercy, in light of Him giving Himself to us, if you're a follower of Christ in the room, in light of Him giving to us this is our pattern let's let's stop being shoved in some daggum mold that doesn't fit us because of either our past or where we're living currently 
Stop. You can. But it's going to take tenacity to stop. To stop conforming. And then he says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Allow God's word, allow his spirit to change you, to reveal to you to the power comes from him and his spirit. Our surrendering is what changes things. So if you're looking to see if this is real or not, I just ask you to kind of yield to what's going on in your heart right now. And I believe you're, you, you'd be longing for a new life. And since he's already done the, the dying and the coming and all that, all we have to do is do the receiving. If you're a follower of Christ, let me encourage you. You've been hurt. Dust yourself off and get back in the game. Other things have surfaced and have become more of a priority in your life than chasing down, chasing down God and discipleship. I get it. We all have to recalibrate. I'm just telling you that the, what, what you're after is not going to produce the results you hope it produces. And so it's still worth an effort. I get it, but not my best effort. Not my best effort. My best after effort is being shaped into Christ, His nature. And I'm going to seek first His kingdom. And the rest of the stuff is going to take care of itself. So I just wanted to, wanted to, to just kind of a, a way to cement things here in the last minute would be um, for, for Pastor Chris to kind of lead us in that bridge of that song, I Can't Thank You Enough. Because it, it kind of epitomizes what I've talked about today. Open, the open hands. The giving heart. So if you'd stand for prayer, then we'll sing, we'll sing just a few times through this bridge and then I'll do the benediction. Father, we thank you for our time together today. Thank you for your word, Lord, that's strong and true. Lord, I pray today that um, some more roots were planted, some decisions made. Lord, you're calling us to have a tenacious approach to discipleship, to looking like you. Wake us all up to that, Lord Jesus, that that's the life that brings peace and purpose. We offer ourselves to you, Father. So I open my head. I offer my heart and I surrender all back to you. I open my hands, I offer my heart and I surrender all back to you. I open my hands, I open my hands. I open my hands, I offer my heart, and I surrender all back to you. Father, I believe you hear every prayer, every thought that's on our heart, our mind, every question that we have. I pray today that as you have wooed us to you, Lord, that we would respond. Thank you for your son. Thank you for new life. May we live it abundantly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you're a guest with us today, it's been great having you a part of our worship service. Um, right outside these double doors to my left, uh, we have a gift for you. Um, we've kind of relocated the Connect Center just for a few weeks, but love to get a chance to meet you. Um, if you haven't begun serving around here, it's a great way to get to know somebody great way to grow in Christ. We have opportunities there, but also of our small groups. 30 small groups. The most small groups we've ever offered a semester is this semester. You know what that tells me? That tells me there's been more people that wanted to help other people be discipled. That's a real, really encouraging thing. But guess what? I would imagine that next semester, 30 is not going to be enough. So what's God calling you? What's God calling you to do? Now for the benediction, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace.
you're rising up, you're laying down, you're going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.